Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Gilbert, and on behalf of Roman's Bookstore, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us for our virtual event with Donovan Hahn and Tom Bissell discussing their new titles, The Inner Coast and Magic Hours. We are so excited and grateful that our bookstore can continue to bring authors and their works to our community during this uncertain time. Romans Live will continue to host virtual events, and you can learn more about them on our website as well as our social media. Our next event is Thursday, July 2nd at 5 p.m. with Primo Galanosa with Marie Lu as they present Hey, Who Made This Mess? For regular updates on upcoming events, please feel free to subscribe to our newsletter. This evening's virtual event will end with a Q&A, uh, or we'll have a Q&A at some point, a component of it. So to submit a question, please use the Ask a Question button at the bottom of the screen. Uh, if you see a question on the list that you'd like for our speakers to answer, please click the Like button, uh, which is a little arrow on the side. Uh, we'll try and answer as many questions as time will allow. Also, if you'd like to purchase a copy or both a copy of both of tonight's books, you can click on the green uh, Buy button, which is right here directly below the viewer screen. Uh, that will redirect you to the Romans Bookstar website, uh, and it'll be the event page, and you'll get to see both books on there, and you can continue the checkout process. Um, now, without further ado, let me introduce our authors for this evening. Uh, Donovan Hahn is the author of Moby Duck, the true story of 28,800 bath toys lost at sea, a New York Times notable book and runner up for both the Penn John Kenneth Galbraith Award for Nonfiction and the Penn E.O. Wilson Literary Science Writing Award. His essays have appeared in such publications as Harper's, The New York Times Magazine, among others, a recipient of Whitting Writers Award and an N.E. A creative writing fellowship, Hans spent a number of years editing essays, fiction, and literary journalism at Harper's and a few years as features editor at GQ. Tom Bissell is the author of eight previous books, most recently The Disaster Artist, and has been awarded the Rome Prize and a Guggenheim Fellowship. His writing frequently appears for Harper's Magazine and The New Yorker. Uh, so uh, without further ado, I'd like to uh, welcome Donovan and Tom. Uh, hello, everyone. Since I'm hosting this for, for Donovan, um, I thought I would speak first. And first, a word of explanation about the sort of sidebar comments thing here. I had no idea when we were testing that out that that would remain up for the rest of the talk. So why is Tom so handsome? Uh, despite being an accurate question, is nevertheless uh, was a bit of a joke. So now, now we all have to just live with that. Um, so Donovan, I'm so happy to be here with you. Uh, you and I have known each other since the Clinton administration. 23 years ago, I met you. Uh, you are one of my favorite writers. Uh, Moby Duck is a book that I still occasionally open up and look at and gnash my teeth in envy. And uh, some of the essays in this book are um, you know, some of my favorite pieces of modern writing. And I, and I say that sincerely, not just as virtual event puffery, which is not a phrase I've ever used before. Um, but I thought it would be fun to talk briefly about our first encounter. So as I recall, uh, we met when I was an intern at Harper's Magazine. Uh, this is a famous internship that lots of people have gone through at some point in their um, you know, early life uh, as like a young writer, a young editor. And I'd been there, it was at the end of my tenure and you had come in and all I knew about you was that you were a bartender at the NoHo Star, which was uh, this hangout that Correct. everyone at Harper's sort of always went to the NoHo. And I remember the NoHo Star because it was the first place where I felt like I ever had good food. I'm from the Midwest. Um, lots of good food in the Midwest now, 23 years ago, not so much maybe. And I remember the first place I ate mm -hmm. in New York City when I interviewed at Harper's was the NoHo Star. And I tasted like their, their fresh ginger ale and the gazpacho and I was like, where have you been all my life? This is amazing. And, and the, so the place was like my introduction to, to, uh, to uh, East Coast cuisine. I'd never really been to the East Coast before I went there. So when I found out you were a bartender there, uh, I kind of popped over to check you out because I was sort of interested in this guy who was uh, going to be taking, this, uh, taking over. And I remember I just plopped down and sat and introduced myself and we had a, a long talk about writers and writing. And I remember being very struck by A, how smart you were and B, how seriously you, you took writers and writing. And I remember like, that's a surprisingly rare thing, even in New York publishing, to, for whom people like kind of live and breathe 
you know, just writers and writing and, and that seriousness and that like fanaticism for it, I remember struck me. And I just knew right away that we were gonna be friends uh, or at least I hoped we would be. And there were a, a few bumps along the way, but uh, <laughs> you know, 23 years later, I think uh, I'm honored and delighted to, to, to call you my friend. So um, I'm, I'm happy to be but, here. But I, I have a question. I have a question. I'm not going to type it. I'll just ask it. Do you remember what you ordered when I was your bartender that one evening? A Guinness, maybe? Bingo. Yeah. In the bottle. <laughs> so, yeah. 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 Wow. You were. Is that how you remember people from back in the day, what they ordered? Uh, I, I'm not going to do it, but I can tell you I do remember certain writers and editors drink orders. Um, yes, yes. Because huh. I was a bar I I was a bartender there. I moved to New York not because I wanted to, um, uh, you know, uh, I wasn't like a moth drawn to the dynamo of New York. I moved there because of a college girlfriend to whom I'm now married, uh, um, and didn't know what to do to, uh, with, uh, to earn a living. I had romantic ideas about how you write. My big hero back then was Isaac Babel. Right, and then if you and your your Isaac Babel fan, you know he like he had this part of his code was like never work at a desk, right? <laughs> you know, so he his his thing was because Gorky told him when he went from Odessa to Saint Petersburg, which is not so different from going from San Francisco where I was born, by way of lots of other places to New York, right? Petersburg was the literary capital in the early twentieth century of Russia. And I don't, you know this story, right? When Isaac Babel goes to St. Petersburg, uh, he sure. goes in to shows him. Okay, it's good. He show, comes in with his his early efforts at, at short fiction, right? He's trying to be the Maupassant of, of Odessa, and he shows them to Gorky, who's who says, um, um, uh, um, "You're a good, uh, dear dreamer. You are good at making things up, but you don't know very much uh, to be a writer." You must uh, walk barefoot over nails, and they must be of the larger sort, right? So that's 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 Gorky's advice, which is probably bad. But uh, and B Bobble, Bobble's, you know, what does he do? Uh, Jewish guy from Odessa, he becomes a newspaper reporter for the Red Cavalry, assigned to uh, horseback riding Cossacks, and then we have his great stories. So I am much too fearful to sign on to any military campaign, much more fearful than you. You've been all over the world doing things, much more fearful than, than our friend Matthew Power. I, I, so the closest, uh, for me, I, I attended bar and tried to write short stories and uh, just happened to be the watering hole of Harper's. Uh, that's, that's, uh, that's how we met. So the next part of this story I will tell is that uh, you were the lucky person. Of every intern pool, there's always maybe one person that they ask asked to stay on as an editor. Not every intern pool, but occasionally it happens that you start getting groomed to, to stay there and become an editor at Harper's. And it was pretty clear that was not gonna be me when I was there. So I went on to other things. You stayed on at Harper's and became an editor. And I remember I was trying my best to be a writer. I was an assist, editorial assistant at a publishing house. And I called you one day and said, Jeff Daniels, the actor Jeff Daniels, is filming a movie in my hometown of Escanaba, Michigan, and I want to write about it. And you said, wow, that's a pretty good idea. Amazing what passed for a good idea 23 years ago. Um, uh, and you said, and I can't get you an assignment. But what I can do is forge a letter on Harper's letterhead and send it to the film's production office to get you on set. So that- It wasn't exactly- it wasn't forgery. I was, I was, I was an assistant editor. The problem is that the title, Harper's has a fact checking team, and I was a fact checker. Right. But my title was assistant editor, so right. this, nobody knows the difference. You know, right. so I it wasn't a. I'm just saying it wasn't a for. I, I have not <laughs> committed forgery. Is what no, I'm it's true. No, but you didn't have the authority to commission a piece. Um, Did not. And we just had this thing going, and I'll never forget, I went off and wrote the, the, the piece, which was called Escanaba's Magic Hour, which is the, it's not the title essay, but it, the, title, the, the collection of the book is called Magic Hours. It's a callback to that essay. Um, 
you gave me my first real magazine writing assignment. I had no idea what I was doing. And I took a week off of work and I wrote the piece. And it was one of the most joyful times in my life because not only did I, did I not know how to write a magazine piece, I didn't really know how to write journalism. I didn't know really how to do anything. And I just wrote this thing and it was, you know, I think my first draft was pretty close to what wound up getting published. And um, I've heard a lot of people talk about this, that you know, when you first start doing something creative, it's often early on when, when you don't know what your own limitations are, or when your bag of tricks is still pretty full. Uh, you get so much joy and excitement of discovery. And you know, I don't think I've ever felt that way writing something. And, and uh, that piece really gave me my career. So I have you to thank for for my career as a writer in a lot of ways. So um, now it's your turn to say the same thing to me as we discussed. <laughs> it was, it was, um, <laughs> it happens to be true. The, the, the truth is, the funny, I mean, I, I, it's, it's, you know, I, I, I hope this, it was, that was a bewildering time. I, I didn't know what, you know, it was bewildering. The whole thing was bewildering. Um, I, but I do remember, I remember that moment uh, you were, uh, of, of when you brought that, it sounded actually like, it sounded like kind of, I, I love the idea of it. Somebody's making a movie in my hometown, in a small town in Northern Michigan. Um, but I, I had no idea if you could pull it off, which is why you didn't get a plane ticket. I don't know, right? You were happy, you were going to be there. And I and so you, you did. We did. We worked. I know there's like I think I can I can still I remember the edits. They were light. There was a, a paragraph to bring the question into focus. That's yeah. And I think we added I think we added some of the uh, what they call paratext, right? We added the like subtitles and 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 we used the kind of structure of a movie script. But no, yes, uh, yeah. it's so actually the you know for me that was. The editing at Harp it was a great education. That we used to say it was a teaching hospital. As I've said to you, I, I wish it were a teaching hospital that had scholarships because where I am now with my students in Detroit, I've got so much talent in Detroit, and I want to figure out ways for them. I try to bring everything I learned into my nonfiction classroom, um, but it's what it's one of the things I really want to figure out. Um, but uh, but I got a great education there. But I also I also eventually probably because you and some other people I knew were writing. I I had always wanted to be, continue doing. Uh, I thought I was going to be a poet though. I thought I, I didn't know I was going to be an essayist. So I, when I was like depressed during my lunch break, I would write poetry. Um, and eventually I, I quit um, to teach because I loved the classroom. Um, but also ended up coming to Michigan, which is your state, uh, to yes. do an MFA in poetry. And, and I wound up in California. That's where I was, exactly we traded states. Um, but I'm in Southern Michigan, and you're in Southern California, and you're from Northern Michigan, and I'm from Northern California. But still, yeah, no, it was at, it was at UM that I, I started. I was writing poetry, getting, um, and there was a moment of 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 I had been trying to write fiction, but trying to write. Uh, all sorts of stuff. For reasons, I, I really had a hard time um, finishing things, and there was a kind of a, a, a period where I started writing these prose poems. I remember them still, where, where I was, they, I just, I was so blocked that I just started making these lists of things I remembered from my childhood. I had needed, obviously, we're not going to turn this into a ther therapy session, but I had clearly, I, I, had, I knew I needed to find a way to write about my childhood, which um, was a bewildering childhood, and um, and I had tried writing it directly, like like in a linear. I had tried that in my twenties, and I couldn't do it. So I went indirectly, just started writing these like lists of memories that they kind of accreted into prose poems. And then I started realizing there was a motif running through them of of of, dis, of there was a kind of a geography to the notes. There was a, there were images that were a sense up a mountain. And then there were images of that, that images of falling. And so I had this kind of messy first draft of these things that were kind of beginning to cohere into an essay. And I showed them to you. you I mean, I didn't I want them to you. We were talking like we are now. Um, uh, I think I shared a poem of mine with you, or, uh, with you by email. And, and you told me to send what I had of uh, this essay. And it, was, it became the first essay I wrote. And now it's the, the last essay. Um, in this book, and 
Uh, I don't know. I, I don't. I might have abandoned it, but um, you told me not to. So it's so true. let me uh, let me for people who are watching this who are not our friends and loved ones. Uh, this essay is about Donovan's childhood. It's about a mountain he lived on in San Francisco. It's about a cross. What is the name of the cross? The formal name of the cross. The well, it doesn't have a formal name, but the mountain is Mount Davidson. So it's the Mount oh. Davidson Cross in San Francisco. Californians, if you're in the room, it's the southern edge of San Francisco, one of the lesser known mountains just south of Twin Peaks, right on the edge of the city where it starts to turn into the city. Uh, and there's a 103 foot tall concrete cross atop the mountain. And so this piece starts as uh, a kind of reminiscence of growing up in the shadow of that cross. And then it becomes about uh, Thoreau of all people. And then it becomes about Donovan's surgeon father's relationship to his to his mother and then it becomes about Donovan's hypochondria and then a serious injury that he underwent and there's this motif of Christianity and falling and and the the ways the word falling infects our thinking and our way of Placing ourselves in the world we fall into love, but we also fall into debt and, You know we fall um, You know the, the fall from from uh, uh, the fall into original sin, etc. It's this incredibly sophisticated, moving essay that builds to this shatter shattering moment of tragedy in his family. Uh, barely averted tragedy, I should say. I mean, it was a tragic event, but it could have been much worse. And what Donovan does in this piece is it's, it, it, it kind of works like poetry in that it doesn't have this through narrative line where you kind of dutifully go through the piece and you're following a straight line and time on the page, but it, it, it builds imagistically and it builds with this incredible power to something that is um, like really remarkable. And I, I do remember reading it when you sent it to me and I was stunned, A, that it was so good and B, that, man, I had no idea what a rough go of it you'd had as a child. And, and it made me um, extremely proud to know you because, um, uh, you know, no one's childhood is easy, um, obviously, but um, when you see that you know, someone can, uh, now that I'm a dad myself, I realize what the uncertainty like kids can live through and with, with situations at home that are not super stable and uh, good, the havoc that can wreak on a kid. So um, it's just a testament to your, um, I don't know, resilience and the fact that you could turn it into such a beautiful piece of writing, which brings up my next question, which is reading it again recently in pre preparation for this. Just the stuff about you being in a body cast for that time and 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 like I thought to myself Why is it that essayists always have such great material because I thought about the fact that John Jeremiah Sullivan Who's an essayist some people watching this might know he has that wonderful essay in his book Pulphead about the fact that his house Was the house that they filmed some crappy WB show uh, on like he you know He <laughs> leased out his house to, and he wrote this wonderful essay about like basically you know letting a film crew shoot in your house for a couple years uh, on and off. And I realized that no, it's not that essayists have better material than other people. Probably everyone has really good material. It's just essayists are people who decide to wrangle it into submission and write about it. And I think that's the distinction between a normal person and, a, and an essayist is that this fanatical determination to turn the dross of human experience into something that is bigger than themselves, I guess I would say. Um, I don't know if you would dispute that, but, um, yeah, but I, I mean, I really, I, I had, when you met me back when, when I was tending bar, I had published one short story in Agony that was semi-autobiographical and you can kind of see the ghosts of some of the childhood stuff. For me to write that particular essay, I also had to do research. It's not a straight, it's not a narrative essay. It's, it's not a straight, no. uh, it, the narrative is kind of always, it's it's the it's like alternates with narrative and meditation. Um, it's it's nonlinear in its chronology. There are like there's like one section. I actually kind of love these moments. It's I think it's kind of how I figured out what I wanted to be doing with the essay. One of the things I love the form more than short fiction. Or it's it's you can have narrative, but into them you can put these. You can do these. You can take facts that then within the narrative kind of take on a charge. They take on, a, there's, they, there's subtext. So there's a one long section that's just the history of this particular cross, 
like going back, like in the middle of the essay, like it was actually the, uh, there'd been multiple cu crosses before it, they kept burning down. And then I go into the history of why building shrines on mountains, which has nothing to do with my childhood. But then you're putting into, into conversation these like this, what the, the, these things you've learned, they are kind of electrified by the narrative. They now have significance, emotional significance and narrative significance. But then they also do the opposite where they can take like, like your, your memories. If you just do memory alone, for me, I found it felt like, like it was, it needed dimension. So like bringing in, like bringing in Thoreau. And that essay is really kind of me wrestling with a couple of different things, kind of the origins the Christian origins of my own environmentalism is probably what it's wrestling with. That's why Thoreau belongs there, um, uh, because there is this history. If you go back into the roots of American environmentalism, where it really does grow out of Christianity, and and I have had a loss of faith in Christianity, but not in the environmentalism, and that was something we think through. I do like essays, and this is something that you do in the Escanaba's Magic Hour piece too. Is that is that you're you do you do great work with scene? We get these wonderful scenes of Daniel shooting shooting this ridiculous film that required them to buy robot deer, right? In in Escanaba, um, it's crazy scenes. But then there'll be these long kind of meditative sections that are all you trying to make sense of. What is the small town in the American mythos or the American imagination? Because there's this mythic town that's being evoked by the movie. And then there's your lived reality of that town. Um, and I, I love essays that are able to do the, do, do both that are, that are where we get a narrative. It's a kind of a, a, a dramatic narrative like we might encounter in fiction, but there's also a kind of a journey of the mind that's in counterpoint with the, the, the storytelling. I find uh, I can't write anything non-fictional unless I have something to argue with. Like, um, right. not even argue with, I don't mean that in an argumentative way, um, not in an oppositional yeah. way, um, but just something to talk about, whether it's history or like, um, like an event or a writer or a book. Like, if you just sit me down and tell, write me a straightforward memoiristic account of an experience you had, I don't think I could do it because I need right something and I'm not saying I'm not saying this in pride I'm not saying this haughtily I'm not even saying this is a right. good thing about myself I'm just saying that as a writer unless you lock me up in a room with another living thing uh, living idea living presence I I don't know how to do it uh, fiction is totally different I can write stories just out of nothing but if I'm writing a, a an essay I have a like you can I'll turn I turn my computer but then my whole contraption here would fall over I have a stack of yeah. books on both sides of my desk because I'm writing stuff that incorporates lots of other things. So, and you do that. So I want to talk about your tools. It's, it, it, go ahead, finish. Go, go. Uh, I no, want no, to, I just, I think I, I know. <laughs> you go. I don't know. I just going to say, what I often say to my students and something I genuinely believe is that for, and I'm not saying it has to be the only way to write an essay, but I think it's true. What I, one of the things I love about the essay is it's, there's, it's like, it's like, it's like the kingdom of mushrooms. There's so many different varieties of essay out there in the world. But I do think that often if, if that in, and the ones I love the most, that the writer is trying to think through something on the page. Sometimes you're thinking through in, by meditating on the page, like really thinking that all the thinking is on the page. Sometimes you're, the thinking is in the structure of how things are being put next to each other to create questions or conflicts or, or incongruities. Uh, but I always need to go to something that I that I'm genuinely have conflicting about that I really need that adds that's that's often the engine I think. But you, what were you going to say? I was going to talk about uh, a romance in, of Rust, which is another of your pieces that I absolutely yeah. adore. So I knew this piece for years. You just kept talking about it as the tools essay. Um, yeah. and, and I remember thinking to myself, only Donovan Hone could write an essay just about tools and the idea of them. And I remember, always, like, I'm always very dubious of other people's ideas because, you know, you never know how they're going to come out, right? And as you get older, you, you learn the wisdom that nine-tenths of any ideas, it's execution. It has nothing to do with the innate quality of the idea in and of itself. 
Um, and I remember when your tools essay finally came out, I just read it and kind of sat back and whistled and just thought, how the hell did he do that? Like, how did you cram immense learning about like one of the fundamental qualities that make us human beings, we use tools, and do both a reported essay, a kind of character piece, but also this like deep, thoughtful uh, inquisition as to what it means to use tools. Like th that's just what makes me, what makes you to me like a writer that I truly like envy because I just don't know how you do that. I, I find it really moving and, and really astounding and I hope you know, people will check out the book if only just to see your how you can do that because it's really remarkable. And I don't know anyone else who does it quite the way you do it. The, the, for that, I mean, those two essays, Falling and The Romance of Rest, were the kind of the first two where I was figuring out. Um, there's this line from Baldwin at the end of Sunny's Blues that I teach that story all the time, where he talks about Sonny is is playing with a band for the first time, and it's he's playing it as if he if this if he just discovered a a, a a a a damn brand new piano. It's like what can this do? Like what can this piano do? Um, and I and I think I think I think that the there's there's um, there's it's like for there, I had a moment when I was working on both of those two where it was like I want to with falling I want to go deep into memory. I want to go, I want to do that excavating is how I think of it, like not just writing straight from memory, but like researching the place where I grew up as a kind of excavation. And with tools, that was for me learning, like I want to learn how to do the reportage, how to do um, interviewing strangers, which was something as a shy person does, did not come naturally. Um, but the two, the two key ingredients for me with that essay were, I'm just going to mention this now, my book is dedicated in memory there are two cenotaphs on my dedication page. One is for our mutual friend, Matthew Power, who died in 2014. And the other is for a student of mine named Hannah Frank, who was this amazing young woman who died in 2017 um, in her early 30s. And I had taught her when she was 17 years old. And I honestly say the germ of that tools essay was a conversation I had with her. Mm. Where we were talking, we were talking about narratives of childhood and she had she did some beautiful, she did, she did a kind of experimental animation. She be, became a film scholar, but she also did experimental animation. And, and she had, um, she did beautiful stuff that was, that was, that was kind of transformation, alchemy with out of childhood memory, but she had a wariness and we talked about it in various works of art of, of whenever that could be nostalgic. So that was that conversation that was, it's one of the words that kind of, I'm work as a as a central theme of the book that I'm trying to think through, because for me I'm trying to reconcile. I have emotionally one of the defining experiences of my life is that I am, I have been since I left my childhood home in 1986 at the age of 14 homesick for it. So falling is uh, you've yes there's there were very difficult painful things happening in my birth family throughout my childhood. Um, uh, but I felt homesick for the place. I loved, I loved that place. I still do. I still miss it. But homesickness, if it's the they share nostalgia was just the medicalized term, I think in the 17th century by a Swiss doctor. For, it's just it's just a translation of homesickness. That's what we mean with nostalgia. Right. So so I, I and for me, I want to in some ways rescue homesickness because I believe it is possible to love places. I, but I want to do it in a thinking way that doesn't, because the idea of homesick, I think, can curdle into the kind of um, a, a, a more toxic form of of the, of the deification of a homeland that is really can be really dark. So, how to love a place, you know, like just like you, or maybe even more than love, that's, maybe that's not the best word. How to grieve for the loss of a place. And that's those were already my ideas with when I went into that tools essay. I was thinking about this. Where's the there's a question that's in the middle of that of where's the boundary between nostalgia and memory? How can we remember, which is something I want to do and think Americans need to do more of, uh, mem remember in our own lives and remember historically? How can we remember 
without it turning into the kind of illusions, sometimes toxic illusions of nostalgia? How do, how do you do the one? And that essay moves towards the, the, the key ingredient in it for me was an uncle of mine. I had a character for that piece. Is this uncle of mine, uh, Tom Friedlander, who's a botanist who had went, gone from classifying plants to classifying the increasingly obsolete handheld tools and machinery of the agro-industrial Midwest. And he's got multiple barns and he creates these like dioramas that are just like taxonomical of all these different tools, many of which are, have been obsolete. So there, his barn, as, and a kind of as a character, was that for me, if I just had the abstract idea, what's the place of tools in human culture? No, not enough for me. And it didn't even begin with that. It began with like visiting his barn and looking at all these rusty implements and thinking, really it was his first observation that like, because he was a botanist, all these handheld implements, he'd arrange them the way they do uh, classes of insects when you go to an alley, right? And you start looking at them and they looked really natural. So for me, that was the idea of can you, can I love, I love, I love much of the tradition of American nature writing, but can you, can you go in and look at, at these, this, this barn full of, of these tools and think about them the way a naturalist might, or can we, can we, can we get rid of that boundary between nature and culture? Can we think about the natural world that bringing in history, which is important to me, rather than seeing it as timeless and unchanging and can do the obverse. Can we think it like the, the human artifacts, look at them with the same kind of attentiveness that uh, a good uh, botanist or ecologist might look at the natural world. Those were this, this, this kind of stew of things that, that seemed, all of it seemed kind of magnetic with mystery. With, I knew there was something there. And then I needed um, 9,000 words to, to work it out. Um, <laughs> You know, that's, that's what the genesis of that essay was. Uh, yeah. So would you like to read a bit from either Falling or uh, Rust? Uh, uh, what would you like to do? Yeah. Yeah, I'll, I'll do a little, I'll do a section. I've done it before, um, but it, it's nice and self-contained. And, and, and I think it'll give, I think, I worry we were sounded a little cryptic and evasive about my childhood. So I'll just do the opening section of Falling. Okay. Um, and then I guess it'll, it'll maybe, you know, you'll see how I'm trying to bring history into how one thinks about place. Um, yeah, it goes like this. Uh, the essay is called Falling, but it's written in subsections. I was actually listening to Bach partitas the whole time I was writing it, and I did. I do think there's a little of trying to do fugue-like structure, but probably too much to get into. This is called Ascension. Seeking relief from my father's long commute and my mother's discontent, we moved to Mount Davidson from the suburban lowlands of South San Francisco in 1976, the year the cross fell dark. Named for geographer and nature lover George Davidson of the Sierra Club, this tallest of San Francisco's hills pleased my brother and me inordinately for the simple narcissistic reason that our father's name was David and we were his sons. Our mountain, for that's how we thought of it, was a landscape of contradiction, a wilderness in the midst of a metropolis on one side of which wildflowers, poison oak, and tall grasses flourished, while on the other, a forest of blue gum eucalyptus trees transplanted in the 1880s by a mining millionaire creaked like ship masts in the fog. A public park owned by a secular government in the depths of the Great Depression, the peak had become home to the largest cross on earth a 103-foot-tall monstrosity of concrete and steel. Some 50,000 San Franciscans had gathered for the dedication ceremony held March 24, 1934 at the summit. Far away in Washington, D.C., at precisely 7.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, President Roosevelt depressed the golden key of his executive telegraph. An electric signal leapt the continent, and atop Mount Davidson, the cross, lit from below by 12 1,000-watt lamps, blazed into the night sky like a flaming sword. It would continue to glow a lunar effigy on the San Francisco skyline, off and on, 
for the next 42 years until 1976, when except for a few days at Christmas, the national energy crisis extinguished it. The year before we moved to the mountain, when I was almost three and my brother was five, our mother had run away. For nine months, or was it eight or six, testimonies conflict as they always do. Memories fail as they always do. The record, as always, is unclear. She'd lived by herself in a boarding hotel near the train yards of South San Francisco. The first night she was gone, I woke up terrified that something horrible had befallen us. Above me, the mattress of my brother's bunk had begun to shed its gauzy underside, which hung down in strings that I liked to pluck at, making them longer. Atop the dresser, our fish tank gurgled and glowed. A year later, on the morning we moved to Mount Davidson, I would try to carry it still full of water out to the truck and succeed only in getting the lid far enough for the bulb inside to, ele to electrify the tank's lonely resident, a zebra fish, which on the night my mother left drifted obliviously through plastic kelp, a rebuke to the hysteria that had awakened me. Uncharacter uncharacteristically brave in the darkness, I conducted a thorough investigation of the premises. In a bedroom where my mother usually could be found, my giant father, snoring and alone, sprawled diagonally atop the tangled sheets as if dropped there from a great height. I looked in closets, under furniture, even inside the dishwasher, from which I distinctly remember steam rose. Once every few weeks, our father drove us to visit our mother at the boarding hotel she'd fled to. I remember another night, fatherless time, when we stayed there, drinking hot chocolate from the speckled enamel cups we normally reserved for camping trips, listening to the chatter and hiss of the switch engine moving box cars around in the yard below. Seated across from us, our mother peeled an orange and arrayed the sections into stars upon two plates. She'd had trouble lighting the burner of the stove and the room smelled sweetly of gas. It was Halloween. My brother was dressed as Robin Hood and I, though smaller, was little John. In our matching felt tunics and feathered felt caps, we went trick-or-treating up and down the dingy carpeted hallways of the hotel, knocking on the numbered doors of strangers who had not expressed. Afterward, our mother tucked us into her only bed. Sitting in the dark beside us, stroking our hair, she led us in a recitation of the Lord's Prayer. I loved the sound of the old words, the incantation of trespasses and daily bread, the casting of spells, thy kingdom come, thy will be done. Though it be years before I understood them, before I grasped that these trespasses differed from those prohibited on fences. When we addressed our father, meaning God, he was our real father, I pictured, our father of the white lab coat, our father of the choir robe and the rosewood pipe, our father of the brass trombone. A few weeks after that dreamlike Halloween, as suddenly as she'd vanished and as in inexplicably, our mother returned, and with sort of unanticipated joy I would eventually learn to welcome without question, our parents began looking at new houses. Upon first visiting 475 Malimo Drive, the post-war earthquake-proof cube of a row house that I will always think of as home, our mother fell in love with it. When the fog was low, her bedroom windows gazed out 750 feet above sea level onto an ocean of clouds through which the tops of neighboring mountains Potrero Hill, Twin Peaks, Mount Sutro with its television tower protruded like islands in a heavenly archipelago. On clear days, you could see all the way to San Francisco Bay where the tiny yachts on the blue water resembled cabbage butterflies on a picnic blanket. Even the gleaming skyscrapers downtown seemed diminutive, like scale models of themselves. The back windows of the house looked out onto the mountain's eastern face, the dry face, covered most of the year in a yellow pelt of rattlesnake grass, foxtail, and wild oat, except for a few weeks in early spring when California poppies lit up like orange votives among the new green shoots, and those weeks in summer when the dry grass burned, as it did most summers.
From the kitchen door, a path led out into the garden, climbed a flight of stone stairs beneath an awning of overgrown ivy, and snaked its way through terraced beds, which my father would plant, plant with vegetables and flowers, past a pool of nasturtiums under the oxblood leaves of a wild plum to a garden gate, on the other side of which it continued up the mountain, ascending finally to the concrete steps of the 103 foot tall cross. My father hoped this new home among the clouds would make my mother happy, and for a little while it did. Uh, that is a wonderful piece of writing. Um, thank you for reading, man. Um, I'm wondering if I'm going to read basically one page from Magic Hours. Um, I love piece, that. I really piece, love that. The piece you edited. Um, it's not very long, but all you really need to know is I'm back in my hometown watching this film being made and this is a scene that is shot at my hometown football field and they didn't have nearly enough extras to fill it out. Um, and it was a bit of a crisis because, you know, they'd anticipated having an entire, they'd anticipated having like 4,000 people there and something like 400 showed up. Um, so this is a point in the essay where I kind of wander into the crowd between filming. Um, as some final preparations are undertaken, I wander up into the stands looking for someone I know. The crowd is not my demographic. Most of its members very old or very young. I do see in the stands a number of well-dressed middle-aged women who support the town in its every endeavor, whether it happens to be turning out for the filming of a movie or the construction of internment camps. My press button earns me several hellos from crowd members, each followed by a hurt silence when they realize I do not plan on interviewing them. A duo of earmuffed junior high girls assails me, both asking if I write for the local newspaper. I tell them why I'm here. Herpes Magazine, one gasps, and rushes over to a gaggle of friends. Herpes Magazine, it's Harper's Magazine. Herpes Magazine sees a quick contagion-like spread throughout this small portion of crowd. I am on my way back to the field when I see two quiet boys sitting in the front row. Both are decked out in green-brown camouflage, and they observe the movie people very closely. I sit next to the boys and ask them what they think. I think it's really cool, the older one, Scott, tells me. He shakes his head. Nothing really happens in this town. Now that there's something pretty big happening, people will think Escanaba's pretty cool. Scott knows nothing of the difficulty Daniels faces in getting this film distributed. He does not know that, despite the alien style with which the movie people comport themselves, fully nine-tenths of them are from Michigan. All he knows is that a movie camera will soon turn our way and that when it does, our small hometown in the middle of nowhere will be the only place in the world that matters. Scott's anticipation is so intense that for a moment, I believe this too. That's, um, so, well, I, can I, I, I'm gonna, I'm gonna uh, presume to commentate because I teach this essay a bunch uh, when I teach um, uh, can I interrupt you fiction. To, can I interrupt you to say one thing? Now that I have actually shot yeah. something, uh, I, I, yeah. I, I shot a pilot last fall uh, for, uh, for USA TV. Um, my insights into filmmaking now seem laughably obtuse, but anyway, go on. Yeah. Right. Um, no, there was, there's, there's probably in these, in those pieces we wrote 20 years ago, I suspect both of us are bluffing a lot, right? Cause you're, 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 uh, you're holding forth on filmmaking. Do you think so? A little, yeah, yeah, a little, a little bit, a little, little bit. bit. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, the uh, but what I love in that in that whole es that that essay for me sorry my headphone got tangled um, the, that that essay for me is is that it's it, it dramatizes the ideas because you as narrator are this um, consciousness you're from the town but you've gone away to New York and so you identify with these movie people right you 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 want to have you feel like you've moved from Escanaba to the to is cosmopolitanism coastlines and now you're back there so you're, you're kind of belong there with these people these outsiders but your younger child self who's kind of haunting you puts you with that kid in stands seeing it through his eyes and so there's this beautiful war of sympathies throughout the whole piece it keeps on turning and turning and what you that part you read right there is one 
of the, I think the cre the key points. There's a section break right after it, that and that that and it, that returning to the I. I wanted to believe it too is one of those moments of wanting to believe what the kids believe in. Well, as you know, my name in my hometown was Mud for several years after uh, that piece came out, and it always frustrated me because I felt like my sympathies were very much for my hometown and for being from a small town. I am glad as hell I grew up in the Upper Peninsula of Michigan. Uh, my 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 partner of a zillion years grew up in the same town I did, and and you know it's one of the most meaningful things in my life is to be from a small town, and and. and uh, I, uh, it's always broken my heart that the piece was so grievously misread by uh, the people from the place I was writing about. I did call them, but, beer, you, but beer, you did, did call them beer slaying yahoos, though. So, you know, perhaps some of them. You did, that. you did. But it's, but it's, so, so, but I teach, what I teach that as a piece alongside the AP Newswire story, because the AP reporter is actually a character in your piece. Yeah. And if you read the AP story, it seems like he's being really flattering. To Ubers, but it's just trafficking in the worst two-dimensional stereotypes. Um, uh, whereas, like you're doing that thing where you're writing as an insider and as an outsider, both, right? But the inside knowledge there, I know we cut a paragraph where you actually got to declare, in case there was any doubt, your love for Escanaba. And I remember, I remember that it was we, like we just to make. We cut that paragraph. But, but I also, I genuinely. Let me just interrupt you and for me. It's totally implicit. <laughs> Nobody needs this paragraph. And then it is. As a, it's totally as I, implicit. As I'm crucified for two weeks by my hometown newspaper, uh, you know, <laughs> that's on you. Yeah. That's, well, that blood's on your power, Truth to power. Yeah, <laughs> it, it probably is. But the. <laughs> But I, I do think it's totally implicit when I read that essay that you're writing. That's you, you, you're writing with the deep. It's like, frankly, not so different from than falling. I'm writing about my family, and for me, that's hard. Like when you're writing, you know, it's hard. Like I, I know it's hard. I know it was hard for certain people in my family that I wrote that I wrote that piece. Um, I feel like it's my story and have a right. Uh, and I did have had family members whose opinion I value highly tell me that they feel it was. As, as hard as it is on on what it reveals, it's a confessional essay in some respects about myself. But I also am wrestling with 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 members of that family, and um, especially my mother. Um, and I, I've been told by readers I trust that it's a bit of empathy, um, and I'd like to believe that's true. I don't know if it's going to feel that way uh, for the people who are who are who are going from from who are entering my essays, my words, but uh, well, that's what I, I hope for. I've written about my family. I've written lots of profiles. And one of the truisms, for any of the aspiring writers who are watching this, one of the weird truisms you discover is that when you're writing about other people, you have a real responsibility to know that there's a defenseless person on the mm -hmm. other end of your, of your prose and to be mindful of them and to be respectful of that. And uh, never pick a fight that hasn't been earned. Um, never attack right. somebody with, without, without provocation. Um, right. right. But the weird thing you realize is that the things you think are going to send people up the wall are never the things that send people up the wall. What send people up the wall are some completely meaningless detail that you never anticipated mm -hmm. because people, they, they deflect all of their, like if you say, my uh, grandfather was a murderer and he killed my grandmother with a, with an ax, you know, um, the outrage will be like it wasn't an axe; it was a sword, you know. And like, and, and the, the you see when you're writing about people that that they, these weird controversies happen all the time, and and it's a really peculiar process that I've never quite gotten my head around. Uh, but then, of course, nobody has ever written, um, you know, uh, about me in that. Well, one person did, um, and we don't speak anymore. No, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> this is this is Gideon Lewis Krauss's book uh, about our walk across. Spain. Yes, he did. He did. He wrote about you. Yeah. yeah, yeah I've, I've been called. I've been when Moby Duck came out. I got called things. I got. Um, uh, uh, I got profiled. Very short newspaper profile for UK, and they um, they said uh, I was showing them the little plastic duckies from, from 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 that book and i had them in a handbag the various animals and they said i pulled them out like a low rent magician which which, <laughs> uh, which which i actually which i actually which i which i actually loved i wanted to get like a business card but low rent magician that's accurate. that's good accurate, so. accurate. 
Do we have any questions? Do we, yeah, maybe, yeah, yeah. Let's let's do some yeah. questions. But first, I was going to say I was once described in print by a journalist as disheveled, and I've never forgotten it, and I've never forgiven it. So um, let me ask our first. Uh, yeah. uh, when did you each realize you wanted to be writers? Um, Donovan, would you like to, to feel that one? So uh, yeah, I think we all probably have different because we're looking for a beginning somewhere and like if we want to like sit down with a therapist we could probably go all the way back to the beginning but the place where i remember it is i think i was uh when I, i've often said this but it's true when i was like uh, a, a really religious um but uh nature boy in san francisco at like 12 i wanted i was choosing between oceanographer poet and priest those were the three i kind of oh, imagined as possibilities yeah, yeah so dude. i got rid of priest oh. first and so yeah but the the i i mean i do have an answer which is which is my family um moved from san francisco to to, to texas and i have great fondness for houston now but when i was like 14 going from san francisco to texas i was just miserable and i we just, I started filling journals with like poetry, prose, and it was really homesickness is what got me into it. And in my loneliness at my new high school, I spent my lunch hour in the library and I sought out things that, re that reminded me of California. So I, I read like all of Steinbeck in 10th grade while avoiding the cafeteria. Um, and so like it really, memory memory and a loss of, of home was kind of one of the impetuses, I think, from the beginning. What about you? Well, I was immensely uh, lucky that my father was very good friends with two pretty prominent writers. One was a writer named Philip Caputo, and the other is a writer named Jim Harrison. And um, Jim Phil Caputo has written a lot of books, but his most famous book is a book called The Rumor of War, uh, which is about his Vietnam experience. And Jim Harrison, I think probably his most famous book is Legends of the Fall, which became a movie in which you saw Brad Pitt's butt. Um, so uh, Jim and uh, Phil were always around you know, figuratively during hunting season and, and you know, um, literally during hunting season, but figuratively they were always around in my head. They just seemed like such interesting people and they'd show up and their books would accumulate on my dad's shelf. And I started reading pretty seriously at a young age, mostly just to read these books of these guys that turned up during hunting season. And it just seemed like a cool job, you know? Uh, it seemed like yeah. a cool thing to do. I didn't really understand that it was a psychic torment uh, of which there is no end when I started, um, but <laughs> there it was their influence that 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 turned me on to writing. And you know, I feel immensely fortunate that I grew up in a, a pretty rural place, in a place where not a lot of writers come out of. Some certainly do, but not a lot. It's not like growing up in New York City or Boston or something. Uh, See, but that's I, but, I feel very lucky. But that's interesting because you. So you like because you often like when you when you um, comically uh, do self portraiture of your younger self, you you cast yourself as this living in Escanaba, Upers, far from the coast. But you had two writers in your family social circle that you could look to as like that's a thing you can do. I mean, I don't think I I don't think I ever had any of that. In fact, I mean, it was that's part until 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 like college. But I did have, and I'll say this because I see his name on this thread, is I had an uncle, my uncle Hubert, who had gone into art photography, um, uh, had and had gone into art. He'd studied with uh, Ansel Adams, among others. Eventually, later, John Cage, he studied with. So he. He was an artist, so I had the the model in my that one figure in the family who had had said, "You can be, you don't, you don't have to be law, business, medicine, teaching. That um, you can, you can, you can actually be an artist." And and I and that was that was right before you met me. I'd been living with him, and I think that's partly why I was trying to figure out how does how do you do this being an artist in America? Because it's America doesn't really make it easy. Uh, our next question is from Leslie Jameson, who's a writer uh, I have never met, but someone whose work I am uh, profoundly knocked out by. Uh, her question is, Donovan, I love how you spoke about the way strands of research and memory can electrify each other. And I wonder how slash if the same holds true for teaching and writing. You spoke about bringing everything with you into the nonfiction classroom. In Detroit, I saw your deep connection with your students. I'm curious what you bring back with you from the classroom into your writing and other essays that have particularly that have been particularly influenced by your teaching. Um, 
the, I, you know, yes. <laughs> they, they, my students appear twice in the book. Um, I, I'll, I, but I preface that by saying I, I didn't write about Detroit for this book. Uh, I had actually an opportunity at one point for a, a piece, a, a magazine I would like to write for brought me a possible assignment and I spent some time with it and felt I'm, I'm not the right writer. Detroit has been so written about by, by outsiders um, that even though I spent a lot of time there and I've gotten to know lots of people from there, I, I don't yet feel like I can really um, write about it. But my students, like I, I read about them briefly actually oddly in an essay by Marilyn Robinson because she I was re I was writing about uh, Marilyn Robinson's defense of the public university and that and that's very much on my mind a lot um, I, I uh, in a way that's not trying to s uh, create a false equivalency I think about um, for, for in my family when I look back at, at our, our family story there, there was my, my paternal grandmother who went from being rural poor in southern Illinois to the University of Illinois on a scholarship, and I look at the public university now, and it's uh, it's it's harder. So uh, I want to. I mean, that's one of the things that I think about a lot. Uh, the the austerity economics, uh, even for um, Wayne State University, we do beautiful work, but it's it's still a challenge for my students. So I think about them. I end the book, and maybe I'll just include this here. I end this book, the book with a with a. I wrote a kind of epilogue for the for the collection, and. And and I have them. This is something I've done a lot. I have thought a lot about. There's an essay by Garnet Cadogan called "Black and Blue," um, that's that's about his experience as a um, as a black writer originally from the Caribbean, who loved the kind of American flaneur tradition and talks about how it changed when he moved to the United States. But that's a tradition I've loved as well. So I think I teach often what I think of as the walking essay as a form. Uh, and I do lots of safety protocols to make sure my students are are taking walks in places that are that are that they've thought about um, their own safety. But they they do these walks, and I I end the um, the book. Maybe I'll read this one last paragraph, and then we can go to the one last question because this is the honest answer to to Leslie's question. In the dispatches, my students write about their walks. I've caught glimpses of neighborhoods and homes I'll never visit. Greater Detroit is an organized place. My students come from all over the metropolitan area and from far beyond it. They take their walks at different hours as well as in different neighborhoods, some by day, some after sundown. And yet in my mind, as I read them one after the other, their essays become simultaneous. Instead of making Detroit and the region more real to me, the glimpses I catch in their essays have made me feel as if I were haunting the place where I live and work a ghost viewing the city and region from on high through a toy kaleidoscope equipped with a zoom lens. Give the cylinder a turn and the fragmentary images tumble. Patterns emerge. Images of snowy salted sidewalks, bare tree branches, as do puddles of slush, trash snagged in the empty diamonds of hurricane fences. My students often write sentences that are lovely, and even some of their unlovely sentences are moving to me. All human lives are poignant when seen intimately, but from a distance. This may help explain the widespread belief contradicted by so much evidence in a loving God. That's how my book ends, with them on my mind. Uh, let's do one final question here. Uh, Tom discussed the sort of freewheeling, less self-conscious joy of writing his first essay when everything felt new and experimental and that it never or rarely feels that way again. Um, how to keep writing if that feeling fades? How has that feeling changed with time? Uh, how has it changed your approach to ideation, first drafting, etc.? Um, I would just say I'm glad that feeling went away because, uh, you know, if it were always fun, it <laughs> it wouldn't be real, and you probably wouldn't be doing it professionally because uh, writing is hard. It's it's you know it's not breaking rocks for a living. Certainly, there are far harder jobs in writing, but it's a pretty terrible. Thing when it's going bad because you're just locked in your head, which is where the problem is, but it's also where the only answers are, and you can get really wrapped up in the Ouroboros of your own bullshit when you, you go down that, that that place. But that feeling of not knowing what you're doing and the joy of not knowing what you're doing gives way to some a determination to not skate by on charm or style or just the the joie de vivre for the second time. Uh, to use that phrase for the second time during this talk. 
Uh, oh wait, no, you used it in the green room. Sorry, I just blew it. I did. Um, I did. You're not just skating by on Juana yeah. Cooper's style or just the personality of your writing. It actually makes you endeavor to try to say something more meaningful than than, than, than you might otherwise do if you were just still delighted by the form and, and uh, fact that you got to write something for money, you know? Because um, it's a pretty heady thing when you first start getting paid for it. And then you realize this is a job, it's a great job, but it is still a job and you got to do the work. And you know, not everybody who's a fireman feels like putting out fires <laughs> when the bell rings, but you gotta, you gotta charge over there anyway. It doesn't really matter what you feel like doing. And I think that's kind of the attitude you wind up having because everything becomes work ultimately. It doesn't matter what you do. It all becomes your job. Every now and then there's a moment of, 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 of joy in the composition, but, but I think it's also evidence in the number of books you've published, Tom, eight, and the number of uh, books that I've published. Ten, ten actually, one's coming ten. out. Ten. Oh, why don't you men mention that now? What, what's, what's the title uh, of it coming in October? Story uh, collection. It is a short story collection called Creative Types. It comes out in October. Fantastic. Um, but I, this is number two thing. I so we, there's I do there's something that I was told by a poet many years ago that I think I I still think about. It's one of those things I don't remember most of the advice, the the saws and wisdoms and platitudes that people sometimes uh, older writers say to students. But uh, the poet Frank Bedard had said this thing about I guess when you're a student and you, you want to study, you're studying a, a craft and a tradition and learning how other people's minds made meaning. But really, what you're trying to do is figure out how your own mind makes meaning. And I and I do feel like for me, that is a kind of license. One of the ways my own mind makes meaning, however, is extremely slowly. Um, so I, I just I, I, I have to, I spend I'll, I'll spend nine months writing one essay. Um, so uh, uh, and that's, I've made peace with it. I'm just I'm just going to I'm going to go with, I'm going to. Go to the pace that me. I'm not going to try to measure my my out my output to yours. Yeah. To bring this to a close, I'll just say that my secret is extremely lax quality control. That's just the uh, just. <laughs> oh, I thought the secret was good editing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Anyway, hello, Gilbert. <laughs> hello, hello. Uh, I think that's a that's a, that's a perfect place to end. Um, so. Uh, thank you so much uh, to, to both of you, uh, Donovan and Tom. Uh, this is great uh, to be able to kind of just hang out with you guys. Um, it, it was uh, and just kind of just talk about process and shop and relationships and 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 just really interesting and great stuff. So thank you so much for for being a part of uh, Roman's uh, events here. Our, my pleasure. Thank you, Gilbert, know. for hosting. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and thank uh, you to everybody. Actually, I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. It's it's I, our pleasure, yeah. and we hope to have okay. uh, the chance to have the both of you in in the future <laughs> when people gather in groups, uh, whenever that may be. Um, uh, yeah. And we look forward to that. Um, so. Uh, Thank you to everybody that tuned in um, and uh, for supporting independent bookstores. Uh, don't forget, uh, you can uh, click on that button right over there and uh, to purchase the books. It'll take you to uh, the Romans um, website and both books are available there. Um, Romans is offering uh, curbside service currently and we are actually open daily 11 a.m. to oh. 5 p.m. with strict health guidelines in place. So please make sure uh, to take a look at our website to see that as well. I, I will be coming this weekend. Uh, I'm just going to warn you. Excellent. Oh, yeah. Excellent. Excellent. Uh, I, uh, we, we look forward to, to seeing you. And of course, uh, when you make your way up here, Donovan, as you as well. Uh, I know it's uh, not as easy as John I, for I, you. I, I miss I miss California. I'll I'll be there. I'll be I'll show up on Tom's doorstep and then we'll come by books. Okay. Excellent. Excellent. Uh so uh everybody uh make sure to uh, give us a follow here on Crowdcast uh so you can get notifications for our upcoming events and um then um we can also uh, you can also uh, once you're registered here you'll be able to check out other things and you can also um 
rewatch this event. Uh, once we're done here, uh, it'll be, once you're registered, you can click on it and watch the whole thing again. If there's any little nuggets of wisdom that you wanna make sure that you catch uh, one more time. Um, so uh, once again, thanks so much for tuning in today. Donovan, Tom, uh, thank you again, and uh, we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye-bye, all. Thank you.